Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the California Historical Society. Um, my name is Anthea Hartig, and it's great to see some old friends and new friends here tonight for a very special evening. Um, I am honored to be the executive director and CEO of CEHS, the 17th executive director in our history and the, the fourth women. So um, I'm grateful to our board of trustees, my incredible staff, especially Patty Fort, who puts together such remarkable and um, important programs, our volunteers, um, and of course to all of you for joining us. You're situated tonight, of course, in between a duel. Um, uh, slightly manly, um, but in two exhibitions that tell and highlight very complicated colonial narratives around two very different yet simultaneous and globally connected patterns of conquest and imperialism, um, of expansion, and of course of a range of sets of resistances. Alexander Hamilton, a show curated for us by the New York Historical Society um, and brought out west. Uh, meet Spanish colonial California uh, in our side galleries. Um, that show in particular, I hope you'll spend some time with as it's from, pulled from, with a few exceptions, uh, the richness of our California Historical Society collections. And I like to think of it as the dominant narrative, meeting perhaps not the dominant narrative of our colonial and national heritage, but of course we aim to change that. Um, you will also, of course, take note both in this exhibition um, on Hamilton, as well as in our, um, what we call our kind of cheekily, meanwhile, out west, colonizing California, 1769 to 1821. I tease my staff, it's because they didn't like my title of com comparative colonialism. But, um, but you'll also, of course, take note of, of who is not there um, and who's not present in the cases and on the walls and in those labels. Those, there are many, many voices that are harder to hear, and there are many stories buried underneath the past blankets. Uh, I'm also very grateful that Marie Silva joined us tonight. Marie is one of the co-curators of Meanwhile Out West, uh, one of our remarkable archivists, and she and Frances Kaplan have pulled some very special materials for you uh, on, on view after our conversation. So tonight is uh, the second part of a two-part series exploring identity, narrative, and memory on the Spanish colonial frontier. Uh, and in this period in Alta California, lives and identities, of course, were challenged, overturned, destroyed, and new ones made at a pretty remarkable rate. And one of the key, of course, um, uh, transformations in identity was the rise and solidification of the Californio um, as the setter pop population was transformed and the whole region changed. The lives and identities, of course, of indigenous peoples, those living at the missions and beyond, underwent dramatic and profound changes. Gender, which perhaps for many Europeans at the time seemed a rigid concept, um, found fluidity and greater flexibility on what was known as the frontier of New Spain, um, along with, of course, um, dramatic and horrible abuses of women and men um, uh, from soldiers and settlers alike. Indigenous um, Californians and especially indigenous women and Cali uh, Californianas played critical roles in shaping this new frontier society. So tonight we're um, honored to welcome three wonderful historians who will focus on men and women who represented uh, their era, this era in very complicated ways. Uh, Pio Pico and the Pico family, Toy Porina, who's also um, highlighted in our exhibition, uh, and Eulalia Perez, who is, too is highlighted. Um, and we're thrilled and grateful, as I mentioned, to welcome you to our North Baker Library after uh, our presentation, as well as we'll have a small reception up in front in uh, the gallery that has a really also wonderful exhibition about the old mint. Um, so tonight I get to almost sit down, but before I do, um, I get to introduce our three speakers. Um, Carlos Manuel Salomón received his PhD from the University of New Mexico in Borderlands and Latin American Studies and History. Um, he is a, a remarkable interdisciplinary scholar and an activist who works um, and deeply delves into and, and tries to preserve um, and help us remember 
in the areas of borderlands, memory, migration, and also specializing in oral history. Dr. Salomon is the author of Pio Pico, The Last Governor of Mexican California, which was published in 2010, and the editor of the uh, Rutledge History of Latin American Culture, which came out last year. Um, I'm also honored to welcome um, Dr. Katja uh, Risling, Risling Baldi, an assistant professor of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. Um, Dr. Baldi focuses on Native feminisms, California Indians, and decolonization, and received her PhD in Native American Studies with an emphasis in feminist theory and research from the University of California, Davis, uh, as well as, she, just because she's uh, just like this, um, her MFA in Creative Writing and Literary Research from San Diego State University, lending beautifully her um, multidisciplinary um, proclivities. She has a BA in Psychology from Stanford, which of course helps, us, helps her understand us all, uh, and people of the past. And excitingly, her forthcoming book on the revitalization of women's coming-of-age ceremonies will be released by the University of Washington Press this year. Gonna do it, May? Nice. Okay, you can come back. Um, because she's not busy enough, since 2009, she's also served as the executive director of the Native Women's Collective, um, and also blogs. Uh, uh, has a very popular blog exploring issues of social justice, history in California Indian politics and culture, and you can find that at www.kachariselingbaldi.com blog. So, uh, and she. Uh, Gives us great honor too as a member, an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe, with of course deep ties to the Yurok and Karuk peoples. Our last but certainly not least uh, presenter tonight is historian Rosemary Baby, who is professor of Spanish literature at Santa Clara University, um, and a dear friend to many of you here and to us at CHS. Uh, and together with her husband Bob. Uh, is right there, um, professor of history at Santa Clara University. They've collaborated on an important range of books in the history of Spanish and Mexican California, including the history of Alta California, Lands of Promise and Despair, Chronicles of Early California from 1535 to 1846, Testimonials, Early California Through the Eyes of Women, 1815 to 1848, and To Toil in That Vineyard of the Lord, Contemporary Scholarship on Junta Paracera, uh, as well as because they just can't stop Junta Paracera, California Indians and the Transformation of a Missionary, which came out from the University of Oklahoma Press uh, about three years ago. And their current amazing project, which we all eagerly await, um, is on Mariana Guadalupe Vallejo's five volume, um, Mercados Historios y Personales, and they are in the process of not only translating and probably even transliterating and importantly annotating this, uh, this really critical manuscript. So we all are very excited about that. Um, uh, Rosemary and Bob are a power couple at Santa Clara in that kind of quiet Catholic way, you know. Um, and uh, in 2015, we're recognized with the University Award for Sustained Excellence in Scholarship and received many awards throughout their wonderful career together. Um, so collectively, I think we're in for a real treat as we explore both uh, key people and also I think key kind of resurrection of, of identity as we together as a community of historians, uh, uppercase A, lowercase H, um, however you come to us, uh, continue to probe the complexities of our state. So thank you all for being here and I get to turn it over you. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Hey, hey young everyone. Uh Ole Kacha Rizling Baldi. Kinya and Afte Kina Afte uh Kusni Afte Natinue Afte Hanu Hong Awe and you wanna may date that thing don't wang how and don't may date the thing uh say diet no hong alhalao sintiante. So I um just introduced myself in Hoopa. Uh I told you that I am Kacha Rizling Baldi. I am Hoopa Yurik and Karuk. I also introduce myself as Kunyatyan, which is Hoopa's way of saying California Indian, which actually translates to acorn eater, because uh, we thought of Indian people as acorn eaters all throughout California. Um, and then I also, I said like a very small welcome 
which is something that we would often do, it uh, means that I hope today that we let in only good things and not bad things and that we grow old in a good way. Um, it's something that I was taught to do to sort of help ground myself in the places that I go to. And I'm pleased today to be here at the Historical Society, but um, also want to acknowledge that we are, we are on um, Ohlone land and uh, that the Ohlone are an unrecognized group of people, yet they are very active and um, are still doing a lot of really important things tribally. It's important to acknowledge them as tribal peoples especially in this area where they have been since the beginning of time. So that's the name of the peoples from here, the Ohlone. We're talking actually today about Toy Purina, who is Tongva, which is from the Los Angeles area. And if you've never heard of Toy Purina before, she's probably um, many California Indians sort of favorite person to talk about when you talk about the mission system, because she helped to lead a revolt against the mission system and uh, has become a really important icon and representation of our resistance and our survival and also our resilience and somebody that we can look at as reminding us why people were fighting so hard and how that then matters to us today and then why we need to continue to do the things that she was advocating for um, which is to fight for our continued existence and our continued ability to be able to be here in these spaces. Um, I start here with actually, I have to make note that there's no actual photos or paintings or anything of Toy Purina. So these are, most of the images I'm going to show you are uh, images that people have made over the years based on lots of different things, descriptions of her, but also their interpretation of the peoples from the area. Uh, they often make her staring just directly at you, right? Because she's such a strong person. and to open here with this quote, which, which I'll explain later, is a translation of what she was supposed to have said when she was uh, at trial as part of a response to being thwarted in her efforts to, to revolt against the mission. And so it begins, I came to inspire the dirty cowards to fight and not quail at the sight of Spanish sticks that spit fire and death nor wretch at the evil smell of gun smoke and be done with you invaders. Obviously a very powerful woman uh, who did not pull any sort of punches when she was going to tell you what the point was of her revolt and rebellion. When you read about Toy Purina in the archives, you often hear about her as being described as a sorceress, a witch. Um, they don't really refer to her as anything but something very mystical. Uh, most people refer to her by her sorcery. Although Toy Purina was not a sorceress nor a witch, she was a medicine woman. And in California, medicine women held very esteemed positions in their tribes. Uh, in most California Indian tribes, we had several different kinds of medicine women. And they were people who could do all different kinds of healing. They were spiritual, they were philosophical, they were leaders. And in my tribe alone, we had seven different kinds of doctors. So Toy Purina was a doctor, which I like to remind people because now that I have my PhD and people introduce me as doctor, um, and I'm always looking around like, where's the doctor, right? <laughs> but we always had doctors, people who were studying, people who were learning, and people who were able to then use that knowledge to guide us. And she was a doctor, and she was a leader. But you don't often hear about her like that in the archives. They describe her mostly as an Indian sorceress, one who could lead men to evil. Um, when we learn about the missions, we don't often learn, especially in California, about what the missions were truly like for Native American people. Uh, the establishment of the missions throughout California is sort of told as this tale of bringing good things and civilization to the native people of California. Sometimes people hear that we were starving or that we needed help in order to be able to grow crops, and this is what the Spanish brought to us. But in fact, California prior to the Spanish system was a very great place to live. Um, I've actually heard lots of scholars describe it as like, it's always been really great to live in California, right? We always had the best views and the most amount of food. So we were doing really good before the Spanish came. We had plenty of ways of taking care of ourselves. We had trade routes. We were talking to each other. We often intermarried. 
Jack Forbes says that most Native American people in California spoke seven to 12 different languages because they were, inter, they were communicating intertribally, they were intermarrying. So you're looking at a place that was really like a hustle and bustle. They say it was one of the most populated places north of Mexico during this period of time. My daughter actually, uh, she's in the fifth grade now, but last year had to do her um, Spanish mission project in the fourth grade. And it was very interesting because she had grown up with stories that I had been telling about what the missions were really like. And she wanted to make sure that she did a project that reflected what the missions really were. And so she asked me, like, what can I do? Because they want me to build a mission. They want me to talk about the gardening. They want me to talk about what the Spanish people brought. They want me to talk about the inter, like, the inter exchange between cultures. And I don't want to talk about that. So what can I do? And I said, we're going to do the San Diego mission. And she goes, okay. And I said, we're going to build it, and then we're going to set it on fire. <laughs> and then we're going to turn that in, because that's historically accurate. <laughs> and so she went to her teacher, and she was like, I have to build the mission, set it on fire. And her teacher was like, I can't set it on fire. So instead, she built a mission, and she put flames up the side of it with like lots of different colored pieces of paper. And her report was written about the Kumeyaay revolt against the mission. And she answered all the questions that they wanted her to answer in the mission report. What was the importance of the San Diego mission? How was it built? What happened there? Except she focused on the resiliency of the Kumeyaay people. And she talked about how the importance of it was that it showed that Kumeyaay people were resisting what was happening to them and that it was central to California because it was a space of native people trying to make decisions about what was going to happen. So when people tell me that we can't learn about the things that really happened in the mission in the fourth grade, I actually have posted on my blog her entire report because she is a fourth grade student who was very mature in how she discussed the, what happened at the San Diego mission. And it did not sort of did not make her have nightmares. She doesn't like, like hate California, right? But instead, she's very critical about what she learns in school. And I actually think it's very beneficial to her. What I like to point out to people when we first start learning about the missions, and this will come back to talking about Toy Purina, I promise, is the mission system in California is really a continuation of a much larger, longer historical system that existed throughout Mexico and the southwest of the United States. So when you're talking about the period of time that is missionization, the Spanish had a very long time in which they are trying to sort of perfect their missionization techniques. And you're talking about 1493, which is very close to 1492, right? Um, where they start establishing missions. And they don't actually establish the first mission in California until 1769. So that shows you the length of time that they are working on this mission system. This is not a system that they come at uh, without knowledge of what it would take to make sure that people are living there and want to live there. When we think about it as like, well, they're kind of figuring it out, or they just have to go and shake hands with the natives and get them to live there, what you have to realize is they had perfected this system throughout a group of people who very much resisted what was going on, and they knew the path that they had to take to make that happen. So when they show up to California, one of the first things they do is they go and take the women and children, and they bring them into the mission, because their idea was if we take the women and children, the men will come, they will follow them. So they then force the men to get baptized in order to be able to see their wives and child, like children. That's how they perfect their system. People are not coming willingly. They're actually coming because they're being kidnapped and forced into the mission system. The other thing I like to point out is that the Spanish Inquisition is actually happening at the same time that this mission system is happening. So when we learn about the Spanish Inquisition, we have a lot of like ideas of what that looks like and what that, it's never very nice. It's often very violent, right? When I was um, down in San Diego actually getting my MFA, I went to the Museum of Man, and they had an exhibit of torture devices that were used in the Spanish Inquisition that you could go and see. It was very creepy. Like, I don't recommend it, but you could go look at these torture devices. Now, to pretend like the Spanish who are doing this at the exact same period of time come over to the Americas and are like, but we're going to be extra nice to the native people, even though they're not being extra nice to actual Catholic people in the Spanish Inquisition, it's sort of ignoring that these things are interconnected and that that violence gets transported like intercontinentally, and that's how they approach things. So in 1769, they established the mission in San Diego, and in 1775, that's the Kumeyaay Revolt. So what that shows is 
it's not that Native people um, are willing to accept the missions and then they're not happy with what's happening and then they resist. They resist from the very beginning. It's very quickly that they start to say, this is not what we want in our places and in our homelands. Now, Yunipero Serra, who is the leader of the mission system when it starts in California, he actually is also a member of the Spanish Inquisition. And this is very important because what you start to see is how this is very interconnected. And he, during seven, when he's visiting Mexico City in 1752, he actually requests that, a, that an inquisitor be assigned to this area. And they instead write him back and say, why don't you just be the inquisitor of that area? So they make him the inquisitor in Mexico. And they tell him that he can be the inquisitor in any part of the new world where there's not already an inquisitor. So he carries that with him. He actually, um, in 1752, files this report in which he starts talking about evidences of witchcraft in the missions. And this is where you start to see, remember I told you when they talk about Toy Perina, they call her a sorceress and a witch. You start to see their sort of obsession with women and women's power and the way that women are leading some of these um, peoples. And they see the power that women have because they are the doctors and the medicine people, because they are the spiritual leaders. And instead of looking at them as people that they should be talking to and working with or as leaders, they call them sorceresses who are taking over men's minds and trying to bring them into the evil ways. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you, I have a quote actually that I lo <laughs> love is a weird word, but I have a quote from Unipro Serra. So he writes this report about the sorcerers of Mexico, the sorceresses, sorry. And he says that they have the most detestable and horrible crimes of sorcery, witchcraft, and devil worship. If it necessary to specify one of the persons guilty, I would actually accuse Melchora de los Reyes Acosta, a married mulatress, an inhabitant of my mission. And then he says, he actually accuses the Indians of flying through the air at night. This is what he says about the sorceresses. They fly through the air at night in the habit of meeting in a cave on a hill near a ranch in the center of said missions where they worship and make sacrifice to the demons who appear visibly there in the guise of young goats and various other things of that nature. So this is how he's writing about Indian women during this period of time. So he's telling people that they are sorceresses, that they are committing witchcraft. He had a very big problem with Native women, especially because they were so central to Native culture and Native peoples. So when Native peoples would come to speak with the Franciscan missionaries or with the soldiers, they, they were saying, you have to talk to our women. And if our women are not here, this, this negotiation is not going to go anywhere. And so you start to see the targeting of women, especially, especially by the Spanish, because they view women not just as a threat, but they think what's happening is um, that the women are using their witchcraft and sorcery to sort of like keep the men down and they need to teach the men how to be men in order to make this culture make any sense. So really women bother them and the way that women sort of carry themselves and the fact that men will ask women for help, that they won't do things until they ask women about like this is the right thing to do. Um, in Native culture and society during this period of time in California, women are actually doctors and leaders and regalia owners, can own property, can maintain rights to dances, can participate in governmental affairs, can exercise sexual autonomy, can decide if they want to get married or divorce, they can approve of war, they can order its end. And what they also say about this period of time is that domestic violence is very rare. And what you get is such a low rate of violence against women that many tribes, when they report from their oral histories, they say, we didn't have violence against women during this period of time. And this becomes very hard for people to believe. In fact, anthropologists interviewing people will often say, like, what did you do when a man raped a woman? And I read one transcript of a woman saying, well, that didn't happen. And then he was like, well, that has to happen. That's just what men do, right? Like, what do you do? And she was like, it doesn't happen. And so he kept pushing her, and she finally was like, okay, fine. Like, that's never happened. I don't know if that's happening, but if it, if it did, we would kill that guy. Like, that's how seriously they took this. And so what they're saying is, while they're not arguing that there's no violence, what they're saying is that the repercussions for violence against women are so great that it doesn't happen. This is very different from a... Spanish society or a colonial society where women could not own property, could not choose to marry or divorce, could not inherit property, could not vote, could not participate in governmental affairs. 
and they had no control over their earnings, and men at this time could legally beat their wives. And if a woman ran away from a man who had beat her, she would be charged with thievery for taking the clothes on her back that he had bought her. It's a very different way of treating women. So you see right away they, ha they are in complete conflict about who women are supposed to be in culture and society. Juniper Serra also notes that Spanish soldiers who came with him particularly targeted native women and this would actually cause a lot of problems between native people and, Sp and the Spanish. This is one of the first things Juniper Serra actually writes about when he comes to California and he talks about how the Spanish soldiers would actually lasso Indian women as they were running away and, you and then rape them in front of him without sort of any consequence. But what he also mentions is that the Spanish soldiers were also kidnapping and raping children during this period of time. So it's a really violent situation. And the thing about Junipero Serra is he doesn't do anything to stop it. He writes about it, but he doesn't try to stop it. And that's why you know, it becomes very problematic when we start talking about him as a saint. They use many different kinds of ways to punish Indian people during the missions as well. And this is something that people don't often know about. But the punishments would actually be lashes with different kinds of um, instruments. They would put them in the stocks, right? They would starve them. And they also made them live in a dormitory separated, so women and men lived separately. That dormitory, by most people who visited from other countries, was described as smelling very bad because they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom, right? That it was one of the sickliest places that people had ever been. So this is what people knew about the missions. This is what Native people knew about the missions. They were not pleasant places to be. Which is why you see such a large uprising of resistance. And this is something that we don't often talk about when we learn about it, which is how much Native people resisted what was happening to them in the mission system. And so you look at several instances of resistance all along where the missions were established this, in San Diego, the Ketchum people, Toy Perina, Santa Cruz, like they are constantly rebelling against what is happening to them. And what some scholars are saying is a lot of that is because of the violence that they perpetuate against women during this period of time. That is something that makes people rise up because women, again, are their leaders, their doctors, their philosophers, and this is why they're, they're choosing to fight back. Which brings us back to Toy Perina. So, Toy Perina um, is a Tongva Indian. She was probably like nine or 10 years old when the Spanish came to California. And uh, she was living in what is now known as Los Angeles, but sort of near the San, where the San Gabriel mission would be built. Um, she, what they say about her is that she immediately rejected being baptized or becoming a part of the mission once the mission was built, refused to become a part of it, and that in a in 1785, she had really gained a reputation as a medicine person, as somebody with power, as somebody who was able to understand uh, how to sort of like harness that power to be able to heal people or to be able to guide people in certain directions. She was actually approached by a man named Nicholas Jose who told her that he wanted to lead a revolt against the San Gabriel mission. And they say that he was upset because they had outlawed native dances and said that Native people could no longer in the missions dance together as part of their ceremonies. Even though he had been baptized and they thought of him as like one of the good Indians because he would go to church, he would help in the things that were going on in the missions. Once they had outlawed the dances, he got very upset and he came to Toy Perina and said, I want to do a revolt. I want to lead a revolution. They decided that what they would do is they would recruit people from different rancherias all around the mission. So they actually worked with several different tribes. And this is something different than when you look at other revolts that had happened. They recruited people from around the area to come together to fight against this mission, who were willing to fight because Toy Perina was involved. And they considered her a powerful person, a medicine person that they should follow. They decided to launch this, a surprise attack on October 25th, 1785. They held a, a lot of secret meetings before they did that, and at those secret meetings talked about their plan to be able to take over the mission. Now what happened was a Spanish soldier actually overheard two native people talking about the plan, and he had learned the Tongva language. So he was able to hear exactly what was going to happen and what they had decided to do. What um, Elias Castillo says is that they gave away one of the most important aspects of the mission, which is that they believed that Toy Perina's power 
when they entered the mission, would make the friars um, fall asleep or, or die right there in their beds. And so they would not have to worry about the friars, they would only need to worry about the soldiers. So the plan was that the soldiers were going to dress up as the friars and pretend to be dead. And then when the Indian people came into the mission, they would pop up and be able to launch a surprise attack because they had heard that one detail. So once uh, the attack was launched, the native people climbed into the mission. They ran into the friars like quarters. They found them there. They thought that they were dead. But then they popped up and said no and held them at gunpoint and were able to sort of squash the revolt. It happened very quickly, and it was quite a surprise to everybody who was involved. The prisoners were then put in a holding cell awaiting trial and punishment, and they were held there for over two months before a governor was able to actually come to the mission to do the trial. Um, once he was there, which was January 1786, he determined that he was going to put the four ringleaders on trial, but then the other Indians who they had captured, he wanted to take them and publicly flog them to be able to make an example of them. If you look at the records, there are scholars who have noted that one of the things that they said about why these men were being flogged was not just because they had participated in this revolution or had tried to take over the mission, but because they had followed a woman into battle. And the idea was that's almost worse than everything you did because you had allowed a woman to lead you and force you into battle. The trial began on January 3rd, 1786. And the interesting thing about it is that the guy who had overheard the plan was a guy named uh, Jose Pico. And what he, he had taught himself the language, and so he was the only one who spoke it. And none of the Spanish people actually spoke the Tongva language. So during the trial, he was uh, enlisted as the translator for the people to be able to discuss what they were saying in response to the questions from the friars. And I ask people all the time to think about this. If you are Toy Perina and you are asked a question, the person who's asking you it in your language is the man who overturned this revolution and got you caught. Like, what does that mean about your answers? What does that mean about the way you respond? What does that mean about like what's happening in that room? Because this is a man who had basically ruined everything that she had tried to do, had gotten a lot of people hurt, right? Had gotten some Indian people killed and she's asked to speak directly to him. And then he's able to translate what she said so much of what we know about Toy Perina's responses is actually a translation of what he's translating into Spanish. We don't actually get her Tongva language to speak about what she's saying. And he's able to summarize and decide how he wants to portray her, which is oftentimes talking about her magic, her sorcery, right, those sorts of things. Again, using these words that were very important of the time to be able to treat women as if they were sort of these powerful temptresses rather than sort of like the powerful words that she might have had in her own Tongva language. Um, when, when they're talking about sort of like the translation and what happens, according to, according to Pico's translation, the first guy that testified was the chief of the tribe that um, was leading this revolt. And he, according to Pico, calls, uh, calls Toy Perina a witch with a serpent's tongue who had, in, who had enticed him into joining the conspiracy even though he had no grudge against the Spaniards. And again, this becomes an issue of translation because this is Pico's translation of what he says the chief is saying about Toy Perina. And we don't, I mean, in our language, we don't have a lot of words that really translate to sorceress or witchcraft, right? Our words translate to things like medicine. So it'd be interesting to know exactly what she's saying in her, in her testimony, but there really is no way to know that. Um, there is one funny story they tell about this where they brought in another older man who had participated in the revolution, and they asked him why, and he said, I saw them all going in there, and I was like, oh, see what they're doing, and see what happens. And they actually thought that was like, they were like, okay, because he was like, that looks like fun, right? So I think of that as moments of Indian humor Right? They, he's like, I was just trying to see what was going to happen, right? So um, once N Nicholas Jose, who was the person that had, who had come to her and said, I want you to be a part of this, when he testified, he actually, they said, admitted to organizing the attack, that he was the one who brought in the other villages, that he was upset because he, they wouldn't let him do traditional dances, and that he wanted to bring her in because she was known as to be very powerful. I think this is an interesting moment in terms of knowing the culture versus knowing the archive. 
So in our cultures, if you want to go into battle, and, and battle for us was very different than a battle in which you're like fighting with weapons. Battle was spiritual. It was something that we did in a spiritual way first. And so what they say about war between California Indian tribes, it, it was as much a spiritual effort, a ceremonial effort, as it was a fight between two groups of people. So we would often come together, we would fight, we'd have a ceremony, we'd eat. If we didn't solve the problem, we'd fight again, have a ceremony and eat, and we would do that until it got taken care of, right? Because the idea was, how do you solve this issue? When you do that, you have to get permission from your medicine women. You have to go to them first. And if you can't get permission from them, if they don't say that it's a good idea, then you won't do it. So this man, uh, Nicholas Jose, deciding that he's going to go to a medicine woman meant that he's calling in cultural protocols. And one of the things he says is that he gives her beads as part of this exchange. The translation, the way that a lot of historians have interpreted it, is that that's the moment that she kind of gets like Twitter-pated with the jewelry, right? She's like, oh, I want the beads, so I'll go into battle with this guy. Instead of thinking about the cultural protocol of what it meant for him to exchange that with her and how he was sort of like asking for permission and she was accepting it to give permission on her lands to be able to lead this kind of revolt. She was the last one brought in to testify and when she got up and talked, they asked her why she had conspired against the Padres. The, um, the translation of what she said, it actually varies between people who are looking at the different things. Uh, they attribute one quote to her, which is, I did it because I hate the Padres and all of you for living here on my native soil, for trespassing upon the land of my forefathers and despoiling our tribal domains. Then when they asked her why she joined, they said, I came to inspire the dirty cowards to fight and not to quail at the sight of Spanish sticks that spit fire and death, nor wretch at the evil smell of gun smoke, and be done with you invaders. After the trial ended, she actually requested, they say during the trial, to become Catholic. She repented and said that she would like to be baptized. There are a lot of different reasons why this could have happened, but I'd like people to think about her not just as a martyr or a hero, but as a person. In this situation where she has been caught, there's some evidence, according to some scholars, that she was pregnant at the time. There's other people that said that she was thinking about her people and what it would mean if she didn't repent and the kind of um, revenge that they would take on her people for what she had done. So she claims that she wants to become a Christian. They actually baptize her with the name Regina Josefa Toipurina on March 8, 1788. They put her in jail, and then they keep her there until they decide to exile her uh, to the northern missions. So they send her to the northern missions. When she gets there, she actually marries a Spanish soldier, ends up having several children, and then travels with him to different places. She lives about 14 more years before she dies at the age of 38 at Mission San Juan Bautista. And she is buried at Mission San Juan Bautista. I think what's important to know about Toy Perina, though, is that for a long time, the Spanish missionaries actually used her as an example of how Catholicism was going to win and how in the end everybody would convert. And they used her as an example of a good story of an Indian that finally learned the wretchedness of their ways and became who they were supposed to be because she had been baptized. That's the story that was told for a very long time about her, but really what happened was that Native people started to tell a story about her that was very different. Boy Perina is somebody that we look at as a resistor and all the complicated things that happened during this period of time when you make a decision to resist, when you make a decision to fight, She's also thought of someone important in terms of she did not let people tell her how that was supposed to look. She was the one that was making those decisions. She reminds us that our, that our resistance, our resilience continues, that it wasn't just about the ability um, of us to survive, but it was about the ability of us to continue the things that we needed to do to be Native people on our lands. You will find um, pictures, uh, dedications to her, murals all over Southern California, most of them in Los Angeles. You'll find t-shirts and signs, things that remind people that Native women are strong, that we are still here and that we are centered. They tried to take away our ability to be leaders. They tried to tell us that we weren't going to survive. They tried to tell us that we would disappear and yet we are the ones still here and we are the ones telling the story of Toy Perina. 
So that's what I think is the most important thing about her. Her story isn't owned just in the mission archives. It's actually something that we have made sure to pass along. And in 2015, Junipero Serra was declared a saint. And this was a very um, difficult moment for many Native people because we had fought for a number of years to make sure that that wouldn't happen, especially because of his role in the mission system. The, right after the Universe Sarah was declared a saint in 2015, somebody, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know who, but somebody went around Los Angeles and renamed every street that was called Sarah Way, Sarah Road, Sarah Drive, with the name Toy Perina. This was a way to sort of acknowledge that these are the stories that we should be telling. Not the stories of Unipro Sarah, right? But the stories of the people, the people who are still here and the people who were leading these revolutions and revolts because they were always planning for us, for their future, and who we would be when we could stand in front of people and tell their stories and how we could rely on those stories to remind ourselves that now we are working for our next generations to make sure that they can tell our stories of the lands that we still live on and the places that we still are. So I love these kinds of moments where we remind ourselves that the stories that we tell, the stories that we reclaim from the archive are very important to being able to remind people that even though we weren't supposed to be here, we are still here. So thank you. Hello, that was a wonderful talk. And um, it, it sort of uh, goes nicely into the one I'm gonna uh, talk about today. Uh, Fio Pico. And first, before I begin, I'd like to thank the, the CHS for, for hosting this event. It's a wonderful gathering. So, <clears throat> Fio Pico's family um, are part of the expedition uh, to settle California. It was kind of like the last um, push of the Spanish Empire in North America. Um, California was the last area. Of course, Texas and New Mexico came. Uh, first, um, and then a lot of these a, a lot of these families they uh, came with the ANSA expedition. ANSA was a, um, a, a military person, uh, a bureaucrat in the Spanish uh, government, and they led this uh, these families up. Um, <clears throat> technically, uh, they were Sp they were cons considered Spanish, part of the Spanish government, but um, very few of the people who settled into California were 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 Spanish, were people of European ancestry. In fact, if you look at a lot of the, um, the founding uh, people who founded the, some of these uh, villages and so forth, a lot of them um, who came from these areas were mestizo and mulatto, people of African ancestry. Um, and so that's the, the story of the Pico family. Uh, they had a lot of uh, African ancestry. A lot of uh, people from uh, <clears throat> Mexico went to these uh, so-called frontier regions um, in Sinaloa and stuff to sort of move away, in, in some cases, from the, uh, the, the racism that existed in the larger cities. And so um, in Latin America, there were a lot more, it was a lot more common for people of African ancestry to uh, live as free uh, blacks uh, in those societies. There were slaves, of course, but there were also a lot of people who uh, were of African ancestry who were free. And so um, the Pico family is very, uh, you know, they fall into this, this category. They came up, they were very poor, as were most of the settlers on this expedition. They came and uh, they uh, helped the, the Spanish government uh, colonize this area. Um, it's very... Uh, it's very difficult to understand this because we're not talking about uh, a group of, uh, of European Spaniards who are colonizing indigenous people. We are talking about a group of people who had themselves been colonized um, at one point um, in the line of their ancestry and then became the colonizers themselves. So this is um, a very difficult thing and it goes into a discussion of the identity of, of the Mexican people um, and their history. So <clears throat> the reason why I, uh, I say it, it sort of folds nicely into the previous discussion, uh, because the individual who spoke the Tongva language was Pio Pico's father. And his name was Jose Maria Pico. 
and he was a soldier at Mission San Gabriel, where Pio Pico was born in 1801. Pio Pico says that he was born in a, um, a hut made of branches and so forth. I'm not sure if that was because it was so new at the time, um, or that they didn't have housing, or if it was just a, an attestment to how, how impoverished this family was. But um, this, this is one of the main um, areas of, uh, of work for the settlers of, of California, the non-indigenous uh, settlers. So uh, they worked as ranchers, they worked as military people, they worked for the, uh, around the churches and the presidios and so forth. Um, and this was the Pico family. Um, the Pico family, uh, the, the first individual was Santiago de la Cruz Pico. Um, the, his son was Jose Maria Pico, who was the man who uh, learned the, the Tongva language. And then um, Pio Pico was born at this mission. So the missions, uh, everything the previous discussion talked about is, is absolutely true. It was a very brutal institution. Uh, people, um, the, the way that the Spaniards were so successful part, partially was this. Mexico is basically an indigenous uh, nation. Um, but the people um, in the missions who are, who are Christianized, a lot of times the, the Spaniards would separate them, the children, from their parents. And it was much easier to, to teach uh, the children to become Hispanics rather than to teach uh, the adults. And so from an early age, uh, as children, you are taught that your parents, uh, their language, their traditions, their ways uh, were evil and that the Hispanic way, the Western way, was correct. And the process of the mission was basically to turn out to Hispanicize large groups of indigenous people. And so that in a generation or two, there would be no more trace of the indigenous. There would only be uh, what was left was Hispanic people. And this served the Spanish empire beautifully. Uh, Latin America is the most Catholic part of the world. Um, and this happens to be uh, part of why uh, the Spaniards were so successful in this process. Uh, there were lots of revolts, definitely, um, but the Spaniards uh, had military. Now, a lot of these revolts, af after generations of this going on, this was very late in the game. Remember, this had been going on, like she said, since the uh, 1490s, right? So over the generations, you had lots of individuals who had become Hispanicized. So a lot of these revolts, you see indigenous people uh, doing the work for the Spaniards, and later as it, they became nation states like Mexico and Colombia and what's, whatnot, uh, this was uh, part of the process. Um, it really wasn't about race at that time. It was, it was mostly about ethnicity. Um, the indigenous ethnicity or the Hispanic ethnicity. Um, she mentioned also that there was a, there's been a lot of praise in Southern California for Toiperina. A lot of this is coming from uh, so-called Hispanic people. These are people of uh, Mexican ancestry who are trying to find out about their indigenous uh, heritage and their indigenous language. And this is some, a process that I went through as well. I didn't know where my indigenous ancestry was from or anything about it um, until I started doing that research and I found out my great-great-great-grandmother was a Tono Odom from uh, Arizona. Now, I don't speak a single word of that language. I don't know anything about their customs. Um, and that is the experience of the Mexican people. And many other millions of individuals throughout Latin America. And it goes back to how successful this system really was uh, in promoting Spanish Western um, ideals. Now, in terms of how uh, they really did it, it was through a system called the Casta system. Um, think about, we have a, a, a nation that's smaller than the size of Texas controlling an area from the Tierra del Fuego in South America all the way up to the uh, Northern California. How did that nation do it? Well, they did it by turning the people who were there into Spaniards uh, to uh, think like them, to act for in their interests. And so that's how it was uh, uh, definitely done. Now, the Casta system was a legally binding system in which um, it was a racial hierarchy in which indigenous and black people were at the bottom and white Spaniards at the top. The mixtures of those three um, people 
were the different castas. Uh, depending on how much Spanish blood you had in, in you, that places you higher on the top of the list, um, giving you more rights in society. So any parent who wanted uh, a better life for their children, what would they do? They would try to emulate the Spaniards. And so this is um, simply part of the process of the evolution of identity in a Latin American. It's a sad truth, uh, but it worked quite well. Um, in this, there was a series of pictures that were painted throughout the colonial period um, of these casta systems. This is a Spaniard who marries a, a, a black woman. Uh, their child was on their birth certificate was stamped mulatto. That means uh, that this person is half Spanish and half uh, black. Now that uh, child has more rights than the mother, but less rights than the father. Amulata uh, then grows up, she marries a Spaniard. Um, <clears throat> their offspring is a Morisca. Okay, and so this Morisca has uh, less rights than the father and more rights than the mother. After that, that Morisca grows up, also marries a Spaniard. That offspring is an Albino. The Albino having less rights than the uh, than the father and more rights than the mother. So you see how that process goes through generations of erasing the um, original culture and Hispanicizing uh, the population. So these uh, pictures were often sent to Europe of about the exoticism of Latin America, but they are also uh, um, placed in public areas where people knew where their level was, where their place was in society. Torna atrás, this is kind of like the one drop rule in U.S. history. If you have one drop of black blood into you, um, you would never become a white, um, fully a Spanish. Although this uh, individual, their casta was torna atrás, which means basically to turn back. Um, even though they are primarily of European ancestry, what that means is that you, you turn back to be, uh, revert back to being a black person. So you'll never erase the original sin of having African ancestry. Now, there were obviously all kinds of unions. Um, this is a union between a, a, a black person and an indigenous person. Their casta is a lobo, not even a human, it's an animal. Lobo means wolf. So as you can see, uh, compared to the previous, these are people that lived in relative luxury. Uh, the other possibility are people who are the workers on these farms. There's no possibility of them becoming um, wealthy people. I mean, it might happen if they find some gold or, 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 or something like that. Pio, uh, Pico, this is the individual we're going to talk about today. Uh, his father, was his cast uh, was of a mulatto. So he uh, is an individual with African ancestry. Now, what I found out during this whole period, during my research, is that... Um, his father, Jose Maria Pico, um, did uncover this uh, plot. Um, he, and although he also had uh, indigenous blood in him, and he also had black blood and probably um, some European blood, a mixture of many different uh, ancestries, um, after the, eight, the 1785 uh, revolt, um, the Spanish government did a, a census uh, throughout Latin America, including California. And Jose Maria Pico, his caste magically changed from mulatto to Spanish, while his brothers, who had the same parents, were still listed as mulattos. Now, this goes to tell you that, obviously, this isn't a scientific uh, process here, exactly. Uh, papers can be purchased um, and falsified and so forth. Um, I'm not sure why this happened, but I... I have heard that in this system, you can be rewarded with a higher casta uh, by doing heroic uh, military uh, efforts. And this was considered that. He was listed in this interrogation of Toipurina and, and, and the Tongva people. He was listed as a Spaniard of implicit trust. This is the, uh, what was said about Jose Maria Pico by the governor of California. Was he a Spaniard? Of course not but 
he got that designation because of his heroism. Um, I doubt he was he was in the position to purchase this uh, higher elevation. He was a he was a a soldier in the military. He wasn't a, a an officer. So Pio Pio, Pio Pico um, was born in 1801. Uh, as you can see, he's a man of clearly marked African features. Um, this is uh, something you know. The casa system by this time in the in the Spanish uh, Empire was definitely starting to fade, um, especially on in places like California. Uh, they definitely utilized the casta system there, but it wasn't as strict as in uh, deeper in Mexico. Um, and it was starting to break down a little bit. Nevertheless, um, Pio, Pio Pico uh, would have been listed as a mulatto, perhaps, or, um, or some other, had it not been for his uh, father's new designation. Um, now, his father, uh, because he had this new designation um, as a Spaniard, this opened him up for uh, higher levels of uh, military service, becoming an officer, uh, being uh, qualified uh, to get grants of land. Um, basically, that higher casta would open up doors for you. Um, nevertheless, Pio Pico's uh, father was uh, sided with the uh, revolution that was happening in Mexico, although it rarely touched the areas of California, New Mexico, and so forth. The people um, um, were, they heard the news about it, they sided, they, they chose the sides of the rebels, and so Pio Pico's father was arrested for that, um, and he was never given uh, the distinction that he, he hoped he would get um, from uncovering this, uh, this rebellion. Um, he died just before the Spanish uh, were defeated in the revolution for independence in Mexico um, without owning even an inch of land, according to Pio Pico's uh, testimonial. And so... Pio Pico uh, was at the head of a family of, I, I believe it was eight sisters and two brothers. His older brother was serving in the, um, in the San Francisco uh, Presidio at the time. So the family, sort of the, the, the chores of, of caring for this family um, was put on Pio Pico. He was a very industrious person. Uh, we know that he... Uh, traded goods deep into Baja California. Um, he, he had uncles that lived in Central California and in Northern California. He went and visited them. His uh, cousin married uh, Vallejo, uh, and so there was a lot of uh, connections being made. Um, under the, the, the Mexican Constitution, really to enter politics at this time, you needed to be a landowner, you needed to have some distinction. Pio Pico was able, with his... Uh, small trading business, he was able to purchase a small plot of land in San Diego, opening up him up to becoming a, a, a politician. Now, I've, uh, during my research, I was wondering how this person that was so uh, poor um, become so powerful so quickly. Um, mostly it happened because he had eight sisters and they married prominent individuals. Um, San Diego was a, a, a town of about 40 households, according to some of the, um, the observers, and so there weren't, there weren't a lot of uh, people to choose from, right? So he got into politics. Um, he ran for the city council, and then his next election, he ran for what would be considered the state legislature, um, and he won a seat uh, in the state legislature, which met in Monterey. Um, he then, in 1831, uh, led a revolt against a conservative government that was sent to rule over California from Mexico City. And at the young age of, I believe, uh, maybe 30 or 32 years old, he became the interim governor of California. And this really propelled him into a whole new level. Uh, he, at this time, I discovered that there were uh, the California legislature, all these men were were related to one another. They would have their children baptize one another. They would intermarry their cousins and so forth. These were the, the children of very impoverished soldiers who were then placed in a position to take over, take control of California and its land base. 
They didn't want any Mexicans meddling in their affairs, and so whenever Mexico City sent people down, they revolted against it uh, as drastically as they could. They wanted it for themselves. Pio Pico was also um, the main individual who uh, supported the overthrow of the mission system. It was called secularization. Um, he hated um, the missions. He was a Catholic, though. Okay, so um, he saw a big distinction about that. Basically, what he said is that, and other politicians uh, around him, said that the missions, you can walk from San Diego to San, San Francisco without ever leaving mission grounds. They own the entire coast of California. This has got to end. The people of California need um, to have this land. He was placed in charge um, as a secular administrator of the largest mission, which was San Luis Rey. Um, there was a testimony of an indigenous person um, uh, from that mission who talked about Pio Pico. And he said, of all the priests and soldiers who came into, uh, into this mission, Pio Pico was the worst. He, we had to take our hats off when he came and bow our heads down to him. Uh, so this goes to show you that, that identity is, is just so complex in this area. This is a man of mixed racial an, um, ancestry who took on the mentality of a conquering Spaniard uh, by the time he became a, 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 an adult. Um, eventually, through a, a lot of his policies, Pio Pico did manage uh, to, to sell off the missions right before the United States uh, invaded California. This is his brother Andres Pico, who was a prominent military leader and a politician after uh, the U.S. conquest. Um, can't get into that, but after the war, um, Pio Pico fled into Mexico uh, because he was governor at the time. He was the, the last governor of California before the United States. Um, it was a military occupation, but Pio Pico owned an, a tremendous amount of land. He owned a 8,000 acre land in, uh, a ranch called Hamul, as you can see there, uh, in Southern California. Um, his sisters owned um, two 25,000 acre uh, ranches um, just uh, west of there. Um, going up towards um, <clears throat> Southern California where Camp Pendleton is, that was Pio Pico's ranch. It was called Santa Margarita. It was the largest ranch ever uh, granted to um, uh, a Mexican citizen in California. It was 134,000 acres. Uh, going into, um, into Los Angeles, uh, Pio Pico had uh, thousands of acres in Los Coyotes. Um, his brother owned 121,000 acres in San Fernando, and his um, other relatives owned thousands of acres in Simi Valley up north. So this was a man who was one of the, uh, his family was one of the largest landowners in California. When the gold rush came, he sold the gold miners all kinds of candles and blankets and hides and so forth. He became the equivalent of a modern uh, millionaire. One of the richest men in California, definitely at that time. He controlled politics kind of from the background. He supported the Republican Party. Um, it, I, it was hard to find a little bit um, a Republican at this time. Remember, this was Abraham Lincoln's party. They were against slavery. Uh, California was a, a, a free state, but uh, Pio Pico did not like slavery, so he definitely went with the Republicans. He was the chairman of the Republican Party in California uh, during that time. Um, he eventually bought um, what is today Whittier, California. This was a small ranch compared to his other ranch. He called it Ranchito, which means the little ranch. It was about 8,500 acres. Uh, he built a mansion on it. Um, he would splurge money, uh, he would have races that he would bet $25,000 at a time. $25,000 is a lot today, imagine back then. Um, right there, and this is in the Plaza of, of uh, Los Angeles, that's his house where he conducted business. Uh, in 1870, he built this hotel, um, the Pico House, it was the, uh, the most lavish um, hotel in Southern California. This is his brother-in-law who, unfortunately, Pio Pico had a very trusting spirit. 
Um, he asked for a loan from this guy. He actually granted his brother-in-law, Rancho San Juan Capistrano. This man became a filthy rich because of Pio Pico. Um, and Pio P Pico was cheated from him. Uh, he asked him for a loan. He said, sure, sign these papers. It was actually a bill of sale. Pio Pico didn't uh, read English. So Pio Pico fought. He was one of the... Uh, he would sue you just for staring at him wrong. Uh, a lot of historians say that the Mexicans fell because they didn't understand the legal system. Well, maybe he didn't understand um, all the terminology and stuff, but he had the money to hire lawyers. At the height of his business, he had four law firms working for him. Um, I discovered that he had about 100 lawsuits uh, in the lower courts and over 20 lawsuits at the California Supreme uh, Court. And in one year, he had four Supreme Court cases going on at once. Uh, some of them he won, some of them he lost. In the end, all of his properties were tied up uh, through bad uh, business deals. He, he signed his name to papers he shouldn't have uh, from men he trusted. And uh, he died a very uh, poor man at the age of, uh, in his 90s, um, always seeking to claim, reclaim his land. Um, by this time, he was the last of his generation. Um, the, the Californios were no longer uh, really a threat. They were being romanticized at this time. And um, the, uh, the World Fair in Chicago wanted to come and put him in a, a, a display as um, the last of the Californios. And he wrote a scathing um, uh, response in the L.A. Times saying if those gringos think they're going to show me in a freak tent at five cents a bit, uh, they have another thing coming. Um, he kept his dignity, but unfortunately lost all of his property. Uh, some observers said that had he been able to uh, hold on to his property, he would have been far wealthier than Stanford or Huntington. Nevertheless, um, this man is a, a great example of uh, what California went through in the 19th century. Uh, he was born in the Spanish Empire. He lived as a young man, in the, uh, as a Mexican, and he died as a U.S. citizen without ever leaving California. Uh, it was a very, uh, it was a, it was a century of change for California. And this man, um, the good and the bad about him, is uh, a representative of that change. Well, this evening I would like to share with you the recollections of Eulalia Perez a woman who lived in Spanish and Mexican California, a talented, astute, and very perceptive woman who was able to skillfully negotiate within the confines of a patriarchal society dominated by two male institutions, the army and the church. And yet she was able to survive, excel, and make a name for herself within that society. La vida de un hombre es siempre historia, pero la vida de una mujer es siempre una novela. I'm teaching a course this quarter on the 19th century Spanish novel uh, and teaching it in Spanish uh, at, at Santa Clara University. And the students uh, just finished reading La Gaviota, which means the seagull, by Fernán Caballero. Now, Fernán Caballero is a male, it's a man's name, but the author of this novel was a woman. And she wrote about patriarchal Spain and the struggles that women had at all levels of society living under the domination of, of men, machismo. Anyway, uh, last week I was discussing the novel with my students and we highlighted this particular sentence and my students said to me, Professora, that sounds like all of those fabulous women that you have studied in the 19th century. And I thought, Wow, it does. So I figured I'm going to use this quote uh, in my talk tonight, and you will see how Eulalia Perez, um, su vida no es una novela, su vida es historia. And I'll point that out in a few minutes. Now, in the early 1870s, uh, historian Hubert Howe Bancroft sent three interviewers out to journey through California to obtain documents and conduct interviews with Spanish and Mexican residents of pre-Gold Rush California. Bancroft planned on using the information for his project of writing an exhaustive history of California. Between 1884 and 1890, 
Bancroft's seven-volume History of California was published. In 19th century America, men were usually regarded as the true makers of history. This view was even more pronounced in the male-dominated society that Gold Rush California had produced. A total of 78 people were interviewed for Bancroft's project, and 13 of those people were women. The interviews with the women were often an afterthought, but it is fortuitous that we have these interviews because these 13 women had important perspectives and insights into the development of their native land. They had lived through the gold rush and had seen their country change so drastically since the days of Spanish and Mexican rule. They understood how important it was to tell the full story of the people and the places that had in, in their California, the California that they knew. These women's lives were not a novella, but rather complex histories through which we garner a deeper appreciation of the range of personalities and experiences that have helped to create the world we now inhabit. Eulalia Perez. She was a woman whose contributions to society demonstrated that she was a woman of many identities. Mestiza, wife, mother, midwife, cook, supervisor, seamstress, and teacher. Eulalia was born in Loreto, in Baja California, in the late 1770s. Some people think that she was born in 1768, which would have made her 110 years old when Thomas Savage interviewed her in December of 1877. Based on genealogical studies and the birth dates of her children and the age at which she was married, I think she was probably born in maybe 1777, 1778. Eulalia insisted that her parents, Diego Perez and Rosalia Cota, were, quote, white people through and through, following on what previous speaker Carlos had mentioned. Many scholars agree that the soldiers from Sonora and Sinaloa were mestizo, so she probably was a mestiza. She married Miguel Antonio Guillén, a Presidio soldier at Loreto, when she was 15. She had three sons and one daughter while there. Two of the boys died, but Isidoro, the third son, who was born in 1791, and Petra, the daughter who was also born in 1791, were with Eulalia and Guillén when they moved to San Diego in 1802. The family lived at the Presidio in San Diego until 1810. Guillén continued there as a Presidio soldier. Here we have some drawings of uh, a Monterey soldier and his wife. This is from the Malaspina expedition. Now, Eulalia and her husband, Miguel Guillén, were probably attired in a similar fashion when they were stationed at the Presidio in San Diego in 1802. Eulalia Perez's skills as a midwife were in demand at the Presidio. She was the only woman at that time at the Presidio who knew how to deliver babies. She says that she was truly appreciated by the families of San Diego because of her skills. They treated her well, and they treated her children very well. At times when she needed help, these families provided for her children. Eulalia traveled frequently from San Diego to San Gabriel to assist women who were in labor. She recalled that in 1801, she was the midwife who helped in the delivery of Pio Pico. In 1810, Eulalia and her family moved from San Diego to Mission San Gabriel, where her husband served in the mission guard, the Escolta. Eulalia Perez was at San Juan Capistrano during the 1812 earthquake. She was pregnant at the time, and she tells Savage it was terrible. People were panicking, and they pushed her down, and they were walking on her. They were trampling on her. She couldn't get up. She finally was able to get up, and she immediately returned to San Diego, and she says, very soon after, I gave birth to my daughter, Maria de Los Angeles. I bet she did. Now, the women who gave their testimonials tended to recall events such as the earthquake in connection with what was happening in their own lives, in their family, and in society. Their recollection of events was not tied to the deeds of the military or politics. 
Their social universe was centered more around the family, women, children, and ordinary folks. The California that emerged from the testimonials of people like Eulalia Perez show us that this frontier was a complicated place in which the familial intersected with the political and in which the public sphere interacted with the private sphere to create a different kind of society than the ones the Americans had brought. In 1814, Eulalia and her family returned to San Diego. Her husband was very ill, and he wanted to retire from the military. Around 1815, they returned to San Gabriel, and Miguel died soon after in Los Angeles. Now that she was a widow, she had to find a way to support her family. Moving back and forth from San Gabriel to San Diego put a real strain on them. Knowing that she had unique and indispensable talents as a midwife, and that she had earned the respect of the military in San Diego because of this skill, she decided that she should move back to San Diego. She and her family lived with Presidio Commander Santiago Arguello and his family at the Presidio. Eulalia Perez's mentality reminds me very much of how my own grandmother used to think. My grandmother didn't know very much English. She came from Cuba, and she got by with her English, but she was always very proud of saying, yo me puedo defender, which means I can take care of myself. And you know what? I think that was Eulalia's mentality, too. She damn well, sorry, <laughs> could take care of herself. In 1821, Eulalia Perez's services were in demand again at Mission San Gabriel. The father there, Jose Sanchez, wrote to his cousin, Father Fernando, at Mission San Diego, requesting that he speak with the San Diego Presidio commander to allow Eulalia's son, Isidoro, to bring her and the whole family back to San Gabriel. So now we have the missionaries and the military vying for this woman's services. Father Sanchez promised to provide Eulalia and her family with a small house until she could find work. Isidoro would be allowed to serve in the mission guard, so they all moved from San Diego back to San Gabriel. Midwifery was not Eulalia Perez's only skill. She was an excellent cook and had what today we would probably call good people skills in that she proved to be an excellent supervisor. Eulalia recounts that there were two women in the area who were experienced cooks, and they would be called upon by the priest to prepare meals on special days, like important feast days. One of the women, Maria Luisa Cota, was the wife of the Mission Mayordomo of Mission San Gabriel. Keep that in mind. Eulalia mentioned that the priests were looking for a way to help her support her family, and they were trying to give her enough work to do without upsetting the other women. At that time, the mission was in need of an experienced cook who could teach the Indians how to cook. The priests came up with this really fantastic idea. They decided to hold a cooking contest, and they urged Eulalia Perez to be one of the contestants. The two other women, those two expert cooks, and Eulalia would each cook for a panel of eight male judges on a designated day. One of the judges was, here we go with the picos again, they're everywhere, was Jose Antonio Pico, Pio Pico's brother. And another was the mission mayordomo, Claudio Lopez, husband of Maria Luisa Cota. Awkward, don't you think? A bit awkward. Well, Eulalia won the contest. Talk about awkward. Wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall of the, that Luisa Cota's house? Anyway, it was unanimous. All the judges voted for her to be the winner. And this was just the beginning of her important career at Mission San Gabriel. Eulalia was in charge of cutting and making clothes and other items from head to toe for the vaqueros. The actual work was done by her daughters under her supervision. She also supervised the distribution of everything related to the making of saddles and shoes in the respective workshops. She was the llavera, or keeper of the keys, 
and was in charge of the distribution of the rations for the Indians, as well as being in charge of the priest's kitchen. She was in charge of the key to the clothing storehouse, the monjerillo, and other workshops. In short, Eulalia Perez was what today we might call the chief operations officer. She was the glue that kept Mission San Gabriel running. Eulalia's first-hand account of daily life at the mission is not a romanticized Spanish revival style account. She describes in great detail how complicated it was to keep everything running smoothly. El Eulalia was by no means a pawn of the missionaries. Yes, she had earned their respect and had gained influence, but she was not blind to their shortcomings which she points out very clearly and directly in her testimonial. She was particularly critical of the punishment inflicted upon the Indians. And this is what she said. The punishments that were imposed were the stocks and confinement to a cell. When the crime was serious, they would take the delinquent to the guardhouse. There they would tie him to a cannon or to a post and whip him 25 times or more, depending on the crime. Sometimes they would put them in the stocks head first. Other times they would put a shotgun behind their knees and tie their hands to the gun. This punishment was called Ley de Bayona. It was very painful and very cruel. She also criticized the priests for being greedy. She said that they stashed gold coins in sacks and boxes in their storeroom. So she is giving, in her view, a an objective uh, view of life at the missions with the priests. Eulalia Perez was very much her own woman, an independent woman with a strong sense of self throughout her life. With pride, she claimed that she would never ride in a fancy coach, but preferred to ride in a carreta because it had so much more legroom. We can also add ranch owner to her resume. In 1832, the priest at San Gabriel convinced Eulalia to marry Juan Marine, a Spaniard who had come to Alta California as a soldier in 1795. With mission secularization on the horizon, the missionaries at San Gabriel were seeing ways in which at least a portion of the mission lands might end up in the hands of those who were friendly to the mission system. Eulalia Perez definitely fit that description. Father Sanchez wanted her to have the land, and Marine was regarded as a kind of tool in the process. The missionaries probably thought that Marine's military past would justify giving the land to his wife. After the marriage, Marine was granted a large rancho, San Pascual, in 1834. Neither the marriage nor the grant worked out. Eulalia said, I was young and agile and good looking without even a gray hair on my head when I married him, but we just didn't get along and we didn't have any kids. Now, Marine was a widower, so uh, he never did develop the land and he never occupied it himself. When he died, his son sold off the grant. Next time you go down to Southern California, if you happen to be in the area of Pasadena or Altadena, think of Eulalia Perez because the rancho is now the site of those two cities. Eulalia Perez, a woman whose contributions to society demonstrated that she was a woman of many talents, of many identities, mestiza, wife, mother, midwife, cook, supervisor, seamstress, teacher, dancer, and singer, and celebrity. Eulalia Perez was somewhat of a tourist attraction in Southern California. Local boosters were touting her advanced age as evidence that living in Southern California, where the climate was great and the air was so clean, you could live to be as old as this woman. You'd be in great health. Well, in June 1876, her daughter, Maria Antonia, the woman in the middle, contracted to have her mother exhibited in San Francisco and at the Centennial Expo in Philadelphia as, quote, the oldest woman in the world. The daughter received $5,000, that's a lot of money back then, for a six-week tour. Another daughter, Maria del Rosario, helped put a stop to this 
by catching up with Eulalia and her sister, who were already in Los Angeles. They were headed to San Francisco for the first exhibit. She stopped it. Eulalia Perez and the other women who shared their recollections were keenly aware of the ways in which their gender limited their public influence. However, much of the obvious pride that all of these women exhibited in their interviews stemmed from their awareness that their own leadership roles, whether at the missions, the presidios, or at home, contradicted the normal limitations on women's influence. Now, before I turn this over to questions, I do want to say one thing. There is one indigenous woman who gave her testimonial, and her name is Isidora Filomena, wife of Chief Solano. I hope that at some point, we can all come back, and I would love to tell you about Isidora. She gives her testimonial in Spanish, which was not her native language. She does the best she can with the Spanish. The, the dignity of this woman, the pride in her culture and in her people, the way she negotiated living on her land, much like Toy Purina, on her land, when the, she called them the blonde men came, those were the foreigners, the white people, shows a woman of immense integrity. And I think it's really, really important that her voice be out there. So I can't talk about two people, otherwise they'll kick me out. But I would hope that uh, we could have a chance to talk about her sometime. If not, you can read about her in the Testimonios book. She is amazing. Thank you for your kind attention. Hi, I want to thank all of you for your presentations. They were very informative. Um, and I guess one of the questions I have, looking at this very distinctive difference between the Native Americans, and I cannot remember the name of the tribe that is here, um, and the Europeans was this matriarchal society. And I'm wondering if that um, today, holds forth that there still is a very strong matriarchal society or that was broken down through this um, integration as it might be of uh, the Spanish and other European countries. Sorry. Um, I, can, I can speak a little bit about that. I would, I would say one thing that we do when, when we sort of look at native feminisms is we try to sort of make it very clear that Native societies, especially in California, they weren't matriarchal. They were actually um, what they call gender egalitarian. So they were very focused on the balance between men and women. Um, it's not that women had more power than men, it's that they had equal power to men. And which is why as an indigenous feminist, we talk about how that's a feminist society. It's about the equality of genders. And they're not just talking about the equality of men to women, they're actually talking about the equality of all genders. And so we had multiple genders represented in most of our cultures and societies. There were people who, I mean, you know, now we have terms for them, but at the time there were men who lived as women, there were women who lived as men, there were men who lived with men. Like we were able to sort of, there was a fluidity to sexuality that was practiced. And this is something that when you read about the mission system, they also were very bothered by this um, gender fluidity and sexuality that was allowed to be expressed. Uh, we had multiple marriages, so people could be married to multiple people. This was another thing that very much bothered them, and there actually is a lot of testimony from people who get upset because they are forced to decide between wives. When they go into the missions, they can't have more than one wife, and they're told that, like, they are, um, that there's something wrong with them, that they're delinquents, and then they get very upset about this the way that they really try to instill what uh, is a heteropatriarchal culture. That heterosexuality is the only way that you're supposed to live and that patriarchy is the only way you're supposed to live. So there's a lot of stuff going on with sexuality in the missions especially. I think that now there is very much a reclamation of native feminisms and gender equality in a lot of um, cultures in California. And you see that especially in what I write about which is the revitalization of women's ceremonies it's sort of centering how our, the, the role of women in our cultures was challenged throughout this period of time. And one of the things that we stopped doing was celebrating women and doing their ceremonies. 
And now we are making a concentrated effort to bring them back because for us, that's what's been missing from the balance of our culture. And that's what's actually going to help us to move into the future. So when we talk about our young women and we say, you know, we have very high rates of violence, we have very high rates of sexual assault and like what's happening, we talk about the importance of how do we once again show that this is about uh, elevating and empowering young women and then empowering young men to support women. So I think that when you see these revitalizations happening, you kind of see how that helps to rebalance our cultures. I have a question in terms of uh, the Europeans that came. There was reference to the Spanish, which I'm sure within the mission system, most of the padres were Spanish. But the soldiers obviously came from various parts of the world, much less just Spain. Could you comment on what that representation looked like? Is it on? Okay. Um, well, I mean, they're, they're definitely not, uh, I mean, are you referring to like other ethnicities within European culture, like English people? Well, the, Span the Spaniards were very jealous of other European powers, so a lot of times they had monopolies on trade. Uh, they didn't like for the locals to trade with other European countries, only with them. So it was easy for them to set the prices that way, too, on trade. Um, and, and in terms of within, the, uh, within Spain, the Spaniards like to think of themselves as a pure race, but that's ridiculous, right? There's a lot, they're, they're, they're mestizos. Uh, um, they have a lot of African, a lot of Jewish ancestry as well. A lot of Spanish words have uh, non-European origins, um, and so <clears throat> definitely that's uh, that's in play there. But they, um, you know, they were fanatical about it. And there's towns, for example, in Mexico and in other parts of Latin America called Matamoros, which means "kill the more," right? Um, but definitely a mixed group. But uh, in terms of from other parts of the world, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I know there were trading with parts uh, with with with. Um, different indigenous uh, uh, people from around uh, the South Pacific and so forth. I, I've heard uh, from Hawaii. Uh, that might have been a possibility. Um, but uh, there's, you know, it's hard to find that in terms of a lot of the, the documentation. Are you talking about the soldiers that were in Baja and Alta, California? Okay, the soldiers in, in Baja, California, uh, the ones that came up to Alta California, they were from Sinaloa, from Sonora, from uh, other parts of Mexico. They are the ones who, who came up with, with the different expeditions. You have the Portola expedition. So you're not going to be having French Presidio soldiers or, or European Presidio soldiers. These were people from the area. So, uh, that, I thought that was what you meant. So, no, you're not going to have... French or German or, or anybody else. These are you have the mestizo soldiers, and and then some of the some of the commanders would have been of Spanish blood. For example, Jose de la Guerra and Noriega, who was the Presidio commander in Santa Barbara. He was a Spaniard, so you did have some Spaniards, uh, but no, you didn't have people from other countries. I I, I think one thing that also happened with Spain is they were very clear that they didn't want to involve other countries in their expeditions to the New World, what they called the New World, right? Which is actually a very old world. Um, because they had already drawn up a treaty between them and Portugal to divide up the New World, to decide who was going to get to go to certain parts of the Americas. And so they were being very clear, like, this is where Spain goes, and, like, Portugal goes over there. And... They didn't want to invite other countries in because they wanted to make sure it was Spain. Like I tell my students all the time, it's, there's a reason why they kept naming everything like Little Spain or Baby Spain or This Belongs to Spain, right? Because they wanted it, the minute they started building missions, it had to look like Spain because they wanted it to very clearly belong to their country. For Dr. Solomon, and that is that you said that Pio Pico was involved in racing in the latter part of the 19th century. 
And I was wondering if you could be more specific as to what kind of racing. These were, he was a gambler, so horse, ra ah, horse racing. <laughs> um, but he would actually, um, he would race the horse himself often. Um, and there's a lot of famous stories about that. He lost a large sum of money against one of the other ranchers who was also wealthy, um, who hired a really small, light man to be, to drive the horse. And here Pio Pico was his bigger guy. Uh, but yeah, horse racing. Okay, well, I, I was track, I'm tracking down a man who was into trotter racing at that time, so I didn't know if they knew each other. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe one more tiny question, perhaps? Oh, right over here. Thank you. Thank, thank you all um, for excellent presentations. Um, Pio Pico, as well as Ilalia, were um, around in the 1880s. Um, when, when the romantic version of California history kind of began to be s spread around through Ramona and a number of other um, works like that, is there any evidence about what they thought, these people who'd actually lived through this amazing arc of 19th century California, what they thought about the romance of the missions and you know, all the, all the sort of the myth, mythology of Spanish California. Just real briefly, I know that um, one of the things that I found is when Pio Pico was um, trying to defend his property in the 1890s, uh, small uh, children were actually learning about him in, in school. And so he was being studied um, and um, sort of romanticized, definitely. And his, the, there was one class that their project was to raise money for Pio Pico's defense. But um, earlier in his life, in the, like in the 1850s, he was detested uh, because he was so wealthy, he was non-white, um, and so forth. But by this time, very romanticized and no longer a threat. Um, and you know, I mean, he, he definitely did not like that. Uh, I mean, it probably embarrassed him, but. In, in all of the testimonials, the women are, as my grandma would say, no tenían pelos en la lengua. They had no hair on their tongue. They said it like it was. Uh, in terms of Spanish revival and the, or the Americans coming in and taking over, uh, Angustias de la Guerra, for example, she said, she, that the women were not happy at all with the American takeover. Uh, Rosalia Vallejo was interviewed about the Bear Flag Revolt, and she is scathing when she talks about Fremont and, and the different things that happened. So I, I don't think any of the women supported the Spanish revival at all. I mean, everything that they talked about was the California that they knew growing up in the early part of the 19th century, the, the life before the Americans came, and how much the country had changed. It was a drastic change. It was a negative change for them. This, this was their land, and now it had been transformed, and their families were losing their property. Uh, Vallejo, for example, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, he had uh, um, Lacrima Montes, the Rancho in Petaluma, all of that, and he, and he dies a poor man. And uh, so I don't think that the Spanish revival movement was anything they would have supported. And in, in none of the testimonials do they address it in any kind of positive form. They do recall what their life was like, and in all of them, and including Vallejo, because he's the latest project we're working on, um, they want people to remember what a good place this was, how hard everybody worked, how civilized a place this was, because many Americans felt that the, uh, the Spanish and Mexican residents were people who lived in the woods, that they didn't know anything, they didn't have schooling. Uh, the Americans brought everything good. Um, but it wasn't that way. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, like Vallejo, getting a little mad here thinking about what he, what he wrote. But it's really important to know that this Alta California was the frontier 
but the people who lived here developed it to the best of their ability, and they wanted, through their testimonios, through their recollections, they wanted future generations to remember this. They wanted to remember people to remember that these were good people, hardworking people, educated people, and they were instrumental in the development of this area. No, I snuck up behind you. Rosemary Carlos Katja, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Three different things to extend your stay at the California Historical Society. Um, uh, book signings right behind um, Alexander Hamilton. And um, yeah, we're going to put a gun to your head so you'll buy something. Right. It, it's awkward, but it works. Um, and then, of course, um, please head into the um, North Baker Research Library um, to see more treasures from our collection. And then um, in the front, also just some little snacks and, and uh, uh, wine and water if you'd like a little refreshment. You do need to kind of keep those snacks in that front area due to the sensitivity of our collection. So again, thank you all. So Anything else, Patty? Oh, Katja's book is coming out soon. You can go online and pre-order. Fabulous. And hopefully she'll be back to talk about it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Take good care.